They said it wasn't possible to escape the space shuttle. These guys showed it was. But the circumstances had to be just right. And the maneuver carried its own risk. The decision would be made at about 60,000 feet, proving nothing had gone fatally wrong and the space shuttle could still maneuvered and could be maneuvered in a stable glide. And the astronauts aboard, who only minutes before had been on their way to orbit, would prepare to parachute into the ocean. As the orbiter descended, the commander would set its controls to autopilot. The astronaut sitting close to the outer hatch on the mid-deck below would remove the curved metal housing from the ceiling and install it besides, beside the hatch, carrying bulky 70-pound backpacks the rest of the crew would climb out of their seats and make their way to the hatch, where they'd hook harnesses worn over the spacesuits to lanyards inside the housing. The jump master, the astronaut sitting next to the hatch, would pull would, would first pull the T-shaped handle near the door to depressurize the cabin. Then another one to blow the hatch with the project prototechnic charges, or pyrotechnic charges, the equivalent of a 230 mile per hour wind would now rush past the round opening in the shuttle's fuel lodge. The jump master would activate a release in the newly installed housing, triggering a 9-foot telescope pole to extend instantly into the rushing air rammed to its full length by powerful springs. Then, one by one, the astronauts would kneel in the hatch and jump. For a split second, they would feel a tug on the lanyard, tethering them to the pole. Their last contact with the vehicle before they slid off into the rushing air. If they happened to catch a backward glance, they'd see an empty shuttle receding above them, perfectly under control and doomed. Before January 1986, such a scenario had barely been contemplated. The space shuttle was considered reliable enough to have a bailout option was not considered a priority. The only way for the crew to survive an emergency early in their ascent, and even then only in some circumstances, was to turn the space plane around and fly back to Florida, the so-called return to launch site abort. That all changed on the morning of January 28th, 1986, when 73 seconds after launch, the Challenger broke apart, caying all seven astronauts on board. The commission called to investigate the accident made board recommendations as how the shuttle program could be made safer, one of which was that NASA should develop a way for the crew to bail out, if necessary, during the launch phase. Although the general consensus was that an escape system would not have saved the Challenger crew, there were a very small number of fringes, fringe scenarios in which a survivable failure during the shuttle's ascent or re-entry could occur when it was out of reach 
of an abort site with nowhere to land because the orbiter was built to be light, not strong. A water landing would have been fatal for both it and the crew after the Challenger loss. The lack of any bailout option, even one that was unlikely ever to be used, now seemed unacceptable. The return to flight shuttle mission optimistically was set for July 1987, which gave NASA just a year to design a new escape system, test it, and integrate it into the existing orbiter. But before that could happen, someone had to figure out whether the idea of jumping out of a shuttle at high speed was even viable. That task fell to Ricardo Koki Maschin, a young astronaut, astronautical engineer who had just been hired as at NASA out of college. He put a scale model of the shuttle about five feet long into a wind tunnel and out of it a tiny side hatch he pushed a tiny dummy astronaut. I just basically plunged the guy out of the side, Mnuchin remembers. He went tumbling down Sometimes he hit the back of the vehicle, sometimes he cleared it. It was a horrible looking. Clearly, the astronauts would need to get farther. Clearly, the astronauts would need to get farther away from the orbiter before they started their fall. Ejection seats would be impractical and the two-level crew cabinet, although the first shuttle test flights with only two astronauts sitting upstairs had them. So NASA's first thought was to eliminate or emulate a system that had been used in some fighter jet ejection systems, a tractor rocket that would pull the pilot out of the aircraft by a tether. Early tests of the tractor system, which would require the astronauts to lie on their backs in the shuttle, open hatchway before firing the rockets, tore their legs off the life-size life dummies. Even though the kinks were eventually worked out, NASA was nervous about carrying rockets inside the shuttle's crew cabin, crack cabin so they went looking for a safer option. Mnuchin's boss, Winston Goodrich, came up with the pole idea. It was impressively simple. The astronauts could slide down a kind of fire pole that after being extended from the shuttle hatch at a certain angle to a specific length would put them on a trajectory that stayed well clear of the left wing, all they had to do was hook their parachute harness to the lanyard consisting of Kev Kevlar strap with rollers that surrounded the pole and jump. Mnuchin tried it on his mini shuttle. The pole would work sometimes, but it didn't always work. Sometimes the mini astronauts would hang up and they would just slide down, said Goodrich. Suggested a curved pole to get the fall started and launch the jumpers off the end. It worked. Meanwhile, the shuttle program had to develop a parachute system unlike any that had ever existed before. One that could be worn over the spacesuit by astronauts who may have little or no skydiving experience. The system had to be foolproof at altitudes up to 25,000 feet and speeds up to 
225 knots or 259 miles per hour. It had to open the parachute automatically once the astronauts were clear of the orbiter even if they were unconscious and it had to include survival gear to keep them alive after landing in what was likely to be the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. The whole thing also had to fit in the astronauts' backs as they maneuvered through the cramped crew cabin on their way out the door. NASA took the problem to the Naval Air Weapons Center at Shima Lake, California, just north of LA. The Navy's elite aircraft escape parachute testing team was based there and the facilities engineers had experienced building complex systems including for ejection seats. I remember distinctly saying, if we can't do it, nobody can, says Rusty Bates, Chima's Lake program manager for the project. In addition, the main parachute, the system would need to derogue clute to stabilize the astronauts and free fall, and the pilot chute to deploy the derogue in order to be fully automatic. The backpack containing the parachutes had to have a series of cutters that would sever a complex network of straps in a carefully prescribed order. We crammed all that kind of logic and stuff to the ejection seat, would do into a backpack parachute, says Mike Herr. The project's lead engineer, nobody had ever done that level of integration before. Once her and his colleagues had a prototype system up and running, the Navy's crack testing team began the process of finding out how well it would work. Six parachutes test tested the system, one of whom was Steve Sotoski. He was 27 years old at the time and already master and already a master skydiver. It didn't seem like work to us, he said, hurling yourself out of an airplane into a blast. Back at NASA, astronaut's office, the whole project was viewed with healthy dose of skepticism. And his 2006 mirror Riding rockets, Mike Mulan, Mulan recalled, many of us placed the slide pole bailout procedures in the same category as the pre-challenger contingency abort procedures, busy work while dying. Still, it was worth testing. Pinky Nelson, one of the five astronauts, picked the fly on the first mission following the Challenger, rode along for many of the test jumps. The test parachutes were having a ball, says Nelson, who to this day has never jumped out a perfectly good airplane. I wouldn't have done it on a bet. Parachutists had jumped from fast-moving cargo airplanes before, but usually out the back door where the aircraft's slipstream provided less turbulent air to jump into. The shuttle crew would need to go out a hatch in the side of the orbiter where they, they'd hit the full force of the wind right away. In early test jumps from the twin prop DHC-5 Buffalo one of the one of Sutoski's colleagues didn't quite clear the aircraft once he hit the wing blast. We're supposed to go out 
and do a military tuck type roll. Stay in that position until you clear the aircraft, says Satoski. He started going into his free fall body position a little too soon. And part of his boot slid down the side of the aircraft and left the little boot mark on it. It was kind of funny. Eventually, Satoski and his team moved their operation to Edwards Air Force Base in California, where they started testing the pole and lanyard system with the pole extending out the rear door of a C-14 Starlifter. We had two dummies, says Satoski. We called them Milt and Shirley. They were actually the first two that ever did the pole. Then it was the first human being to ever do the jump. During one early test with the dummies, Milt and Shirley parachute failed to open. Bates, the program manager, went looking for, for it with veteran astronaut Steve Nagal, whom NASA had tapped to help oversee the project. When they eventually located the unfortunate dummy, Bates remembers Nagel looking up at him and saying, Rusty, why don't I feel good about this? When it was Satoski's turn, he wore a telemetry box and antennas to beam data back to engineers on the ground, including the readout from a strain gauge on the lanyard connecting him to the pole as he fell. Those numbers would eventually go into a computer simulating or simulation of the shuttle and flight. For quicker results, Mnuchin, who was not leading NASA's aerodynamics team for the escape system, would project video of each jump onto a whiteboard and plot the jumper's trajectories, he'd then superimpose those onto a computer mock-up of the shuttle. If the falling parachutes, parachutists in the video clear the vertical or virtual shuttle's wing, it was a sign that things were coming along. Developing the parachute system was one thing integrating into the shuttle and was making it usable for the astronauts was another. Because the decision to bail out could happen very quickly, the astronauts would need to be f fully suited up for the jump before the shuttle even left the launch pad to allow them to sit where their parachute or with their parachutes on the crew seats were modified so that the back or the pack doubled as a seat back cushion for here his fellow engineers fitting all the necessities into the backpack was a little like packing a tiny car for a long trip in addition the parachutists themselves the pack had to hold two oxygen tanks, a small inflatable raft, and a life preserver that would automatically deploy when the jumpers hit the ocean. A water scoop sea dye marker, a single mirror, emergency food rations, two liters of water, and a strobe rescue light, and the pack had to fit on any of the astronauts who could range from 5 feet 2 inches, inches to 6 feet 3 inches in height. The biggest issue was the small females, says her, of designing for the different body types the backpacks had to be one size fits all in case of last minute crew changes, which meant the smallest astronauts were dwarfed by their backpack or by their packs, her team had to develop a custom fit harness 
so the pack wouldn't slip off their shoulders. Only two of the Navy jumpers tested the full altitude projection suit, including helmet and survival gear. They were the largest guy on the team, Satoski, and the smallest, Bob Hudson, to booked, bookend the range of sizes among NASA crew. Skydiving and spacesuits wasn't painless, Satoski and Hudson sustained lacerations when landing on solid ground as their heads bounced around inside the metal neck ring that connected the suit to the helmet. They started wearing padded skull caps to limit the damage, but that didn't make it any more fun. It was more afraid, I was more afraid of landing than I was jumping, said Satoski. The shuttle astronauts eventually learned how to use the crew, escape system, and survival gear themselves. NASA suspended a mock-up of the shuttle hatch and pole assembly above their training pool in Hudson, or Houston. At a height that would provide a rough approximation of the speed at which they would hit the water while parachuting, Pinky Nelson found himself thinking mostly about the last part of the bailout. Abandoning the space shuttle at altitudes was one thing, but he mostly worried about what would happen once he was in the ocean. I always thought it was kind of scary, he says. I'm really comfortable in the water, but being in the waters in a heavy suit with a helmet that can fill up with water was never my idea of fun. As soon as he'd drop into the pool, Nelson would be sure to take his helmet off. He can't help laughing remembering his plunge from the fake hatch into the water. In an accident scenario, the odds of the orbiter being intact and flying at 10,000 feet were really pretty small, he says. Still, there was no sense leaving the possibility open that he and his crewmates could end with up wishing they had parachutes or known how to use their survival gear. The odds may be really small, he remembered, thinking, but if we get to the point of needing to bail out, I'm going to do this right. The crew escape system was never used on an actual mission, although there was one mishap where one of the pilot's parachutes accidentally deployed in the crew cabin while the shuttle was in space. One of the astronauts who had skydiving experience swapped his backpack for that one, planning to pull his parachute or his chute manually if he ended up needing it, which he didn't. Once the shuttle escape system tests were complete, the Shima Lake engineers went back to work on ejection seats and other Navy projects. Three of the six test jumpers, including Satoski, went on to provide parachuting support for the Navy SEALs. Mnuchin would eventually become the chief engineer for the parachute system on NASA's Orion crew capsule designed for travel beyond Earth orbit in the 2020s. In September 1988, more than two years after the Challenger accident, Pinky Nelson strapped in aboard Space Shuttle Columbia for the long-awaited return to flight. As the only crew member seated on the mid-deck, he was assigned the job of jump master if necessary. He would be the one to install the pole and lanyard magazine 
and blow the hatch. His only instructment was an altimeter bolt to the locker in front of him to tell him when to start throwing guys out the hatch, says Nelson. I told him that I would probably lead by example.